You're listening to Chrysalis Colored, the podcast. Hello, this is Jorun from Norway and Christine in Canada with a podcast about color analysis and how it applies to you in a practical way. We'll talk about how to use your colors to make your days brighter, your wardrobe more enjoyable, and your life easier. We'll talk about topics that we find interesting, and we encourage you to submit your questions. A podcast listing is available at chrysaliscolor.com under the podcasts tab. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 36. Today, we're joined by color analyst Mary Steele Lawler of Luminosity in Mississippi, U.S. We love speaking with color analysts from many different places, Christine and I. Um, we both live in northern places, and today we're excited to talk to um, Mary Steele about color preferences and being a color analyst in a warm climate. So, and later we're going to talk about a very special service that Mary Steele offers to her color analyst clients. Hello and welcome Mary Steele. Tell us how you came to be a color analyst. I am honored to be here. Thank you both so much for inviting me. Um, I trained years ago with Katherine Kalitz, who was the founder of the SciArc Color Analysis System. Uh, I went to Atlanta in 2009 and uh, spent a few days with her. Um, I had always been interested in color analysis, but we always just called it having your colors done. <clears throat> and of course, uh, back then there were only four season possibilities. Growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, my mother and her friends had a woman from Arkansas. Her business was called Color One, I remember. She did everyone on my street. She would uh, look at hair, skin, and eyes and match them with these small samples. And then she moved on to big samples. And it fascinated me because I'd always um, been interested in art and painting. Um, she called me a light and bright. That was my category. Uh, my mother was dark muted. I remember that. And this, it, it was very helpful in choosing clothing. We were, uh, so I live in the Mississippi Delta and I don't know why, but we are very interested in appearance and clothing. And this kind of helped narrow down the choices. Um, so in 2009, I felt like I wanted to have a career like that nice woman from Arkansas. I'd never forgotten her. I thought it was such a great service to guide others to learn how to shop and to look their best. I sure how I heard of Katherine Kalitz, um, but she was an expert in the Munsell system of, of color, uh, and she worked, I believe, for a firm that did things like selecting paint colors for automotive paint and big industrial things like that. But the Munsell system was familiar to me because I had studied it in graphics design courses in college. Um, after training with Catherine, I lived in Oxford, Mississippi for four years. I worked out of my apartment and I did some traveling to analyze groups, mostly of women. Uh, every now and then one would sort of pull in a husband or a boyfriend. Um, three years ago, I moved back to my home in Indianola and I decided I wanted a little rejuvenation for my business. And I had kept up with what Christine was doing with 12, 12 Blueprints. And I asked if I could retrain with her because she used the same 12-tone color system um, that I did. So I'm keeping the name Luminosity for my business, but I'm beefing up my studio with uh, new lights. I had been using the same ones, the same kinds that Catherine had recommended. Um, yeah. but I've changed that. I've gotten some of the 12 Blueprints makeup, which was not what I had started with. I've gotten 
Christine's drapes, which are different slightly than the ones I had gotten from, from Catherine. And I've got a really snazzy new website, which would, which will be launching the end of March. I am excited for our conversation today, Mary Steele. We haven't met since your training here in Prince Edward Island, so it's going to be great to catch up. People's preferences and how they dressed are so influenced by what's around them. And we all know that, but I think it's really fascinating because I'm such a believer that all groups of people should have their own color analyst. You know, someone who gets where they're coming from, what they want from appearance, what's in their stores, who else is going to be looking at them, who's going to be hiring, hiring them, all those things. In our sessions together, I recall really strongly that you were very objective with learning. You could accept a new way of looking at things instantly. Like you could mentally compare your current approach with how we were working, and then you could adapt as we went along. It was very flexible thinking. There was no rigidity to your beliefs or your approach as much about your own appearance as with the models. And I thought all of that was just really special. And another thing I noticed about you is you never stop thinking about color. I almost can't stop thinking about color. Maybe that's why I seem so ready to absorb what you were talking about. Um, I can't help wondering if something is warm or cool or how it might look under different light. Um, I've loved playing with paint since I was a child and I'm a plein air painter now. Um, I'm always analyzing colors that I see in the landscape and I look at what people wear thinking about how I could paint them to look atmospheric and as if they were breathing. Even in a meeting, I glance around wishing that I could decorate people <laughs> or maybe modify. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I still remember some of the models that we had. I remember that beautiful, really blonde, alabaster skinned girl, and she turned out to be some version of winter. Mm. Oh, and her skin was just pearly. Yeah. And then I remember the man that uh, was a soft, summer mm -hmm. uh, and he had a kind of a, a a gentle warmth you know not really tan or anything but yeah. kind of glowy yeah and then the guy that turned out to be a bright winner who would so obviously wear uh you know those sporty kind of neony colors yeah that yeah I yeah. could absolutely not wear perfect for him yeah it, it's so easy right when they get they put these colors on and it's just so easy. It's so exciting. Yeah, it is. I don't know if they're as excited as I am, but I get so excited. You have a good about it. memory for it too. So color, it, it, it draws you in. You see it all the time. Oh, absolutely. When I'm driving down the road, I'm looking at the trees in the different, in the distance and trying to gauge, you know, the grayness of the ones that recede, the uh, quality of the warmth of the one. It's just, it's kind of a sickness really. So, it, and when you're painting, <clears throat> just like with people, you can't just pick a pretty color and say, oh, that's the color I'm going to dab here on that canvas. Uh, it's, it's within a context of color comparison, mm -hmm. just like we do in color analysis. You know, you, you have a yellow and then say it's surrounded by green trees and gray rocks. Ordinarily, you're not going to end up with the yellow that you picked on your palette because it was pretty. You're going to have to one that have to do one that kind of melts into those other colors. Yeah, I think of them as in your color palette, like ingredients in a recipe. You can't just Absolutely. throw in your ten favorite foods and think you're going to come out with something. <laughs> you know, not something exactly you're going to serve right. everybody. But you do have, you know, if someone gave you this massive big pile of ingredients, which are your colors, said, "Here's your recipe book. Make uh, as many dishes as you can." Well, you could make a thousand dishes, and uh, it's just you know, picking, putting the right things together. And the palette basically does it for you. You don't have to come up with this yourself. So I know you also, something you loved about our models was you loved it when people were happy with their colors. Oh, yes. Well, because, you know, each season, the colors for each one 
each season are, you know, a cohesive group and they are so gorgeous. You know, I might not be able to wear the true autumn colors, but I remember another one of our models, she was an older woman. And when we put the true autumn colors around her, she just glowed. Yeah. Yeah. It's unreal. It's like I'm making these luxury drape color kits. So it's kind of looking at these colors again, but in smaller pieces. So I've got more of them in front of me at the same time. And it's always this reminder of, man, this is just heart meltingly beautiful when these things are together. And when you take them apart or just look at one at a time, and I think that's why people sometimes say, well, I don't like this color and I don't like this color. You haven't seen what it can do yet. It's just this you know, one single note on a scale, it can't do anything. But man, you start putting these things together, and it just sings, you know, it's, and I agree with you, I think they're all, they're all beautiful. Do you think it's conscious or unconscious when people love their colors, or both? I think usually it's unconscious. All right, so you have this t shirt from Target that you've had for about 10 years. But every time you wear it, mm. Somebody says, oh, that color looks so good on you. Or, gosh, your eyes are so pretty. Was I mean, you may have pretty eyes. But part of that is that the shirt is complimenting your eyes. And more than likely, it's the right blue for you, you know, yeah. or even the right white for you. Yeah. And, and I have that T-shirt. It's a $10 T-shirt from Target. I got it 10 years ago. It's a dark green teal. And uh it looks like it's 10 years old, but in terms of the color, I, I still love it. And I do feel good when I wear it. I know you really um, react to color around you. I don't so much as you, but I do react to the colors that I wear. And, and you know, people feel good when they wear colors that, that resonate. I think that's what makes it so fantastic to be a color analyst that we we get to play with all the different colors of all the different seasons and watch people shine when they're wearing them. I feel like it's helping others, you know, and I know we're not, you know, on the Red Cross or anything like that, but in the Red Cross, but, um, but I just think it's wonderful to give people kind of an infusion of, of happiness because when they look in the mirror and they're wearing something that they love, you know, it's a lift. Or when you look in the mirror and you bought something that you bought on sale and the color makes you look like you just crawled out from under a rock. <laughs> and a I know we uh, we wanted to you to say something about you, you want people to be happy and you also want to extend that, that they are happier. You said something about that they are happier when they're surrounded by their own colors in the home. Say more about that. It kind of started with this friend of my mother's who was in our group when we were analyzed years ago. Uh, and she was a gorgeous woman. She was a true winner. Uh, and she was dead serious about that color palette of hers. And so she painted the interior of her home a light, cool yellow. And it just set off her kind of black and white looks. You know, she had sort of really dark hair with silver in the front and, you know, the red lipstick, she always looked great. But anyway, I just kind of never forgot that. And um, then after I had trained with Catherine, I, when I rented the apartment in Oxford, uh, I walked in and it was these sort of gray poupon color walls and these turkey red curtains. And I just thought, I can't do this. I just cannot. Uh, and so I couldn't paint the walls, but I could, with her permission, the landlady, take down the um, curtains and put up some, you know, kind of blue, silvery that like covered most of the wall. Then I was following this blog by Maria Killam, who is also Canadian. And she talked about paint colors. She was a Benjamin Moore color expert and I thought it was fascinating it was again the same thing with color analysis um, she mostly talked about uh, warm versus cool paint um, she called instead of <clears throat> muted she called colors dirty or clean 
So clear versus, you know, soft or muted. And I went, um, let's see, where, I guess I went back to Atlanta to uh, do a workshop with her. And it was fascinating. She's all about undertones. And I thought, why not use this along with my uh, color analysis knowledge and the uh, kind of supporting information I send my clients? Why not send them a list of Benjamin Moore colors that would kind of work with their palette and extend, you know, their colors into their home? Because for me, it is such a lift to walk into rooms uh, and see my pretty colors. I believe with all my heart that when people in a room are, are in a room surrounded by their complementing colors, they're more comfortable. Or the opposite can happen. I think they can feel oppressed when surrounded by colors that don't resonate with, with them. Mm. Well, you know. I think that sometimes some things do resonate. Um, I'm, I, I hear what you're saying and I, I like it, but thinking of my home, my, my, I'm a bright winter and my house is full of natural textiles and perhaps even dark autumn and dark winter colors. And, and the colors in my home, they're nothing that I'd ever wear, um, but they, I feel happy here because maybe it is because they resonate perfectly with the nature I see from from my windows and um, resonate somehow with my need to be surrounded by nature but I do have a bright yellow teacup that I like using <laughs> that's a bright winter uh, element well it's it's something you know the color thing is something to consider when you have options um, like maybe your trim where, where you have, you know, molding around the floor ceiling to do that kind of in a bright winter color rather than, you know, a putty or something like that. Um, or fabric here and there, you could pull in your bright winter colors. Or teacup. Uh, or, or a teacup, you know, mm -hmm. um, it is certainly a personal choice, and I would say most people don't want to extend their their color world into their surroundings. But I promise, if you would just try it, you would really love it. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah, I I am like you, and I apply colors. Well, I'm like you too, Mary Sue. I apply color to every person I see. I also sit in meetings and you know, mm -hmm. try on yep. this and yep. try on yep. that. <laughs> but I don't do it so much in my home. Um, although, you know, lately I've been looking at a lot of homes and considering moving. And I think I don't need my home to be my colors, but I need it to be not, not my colors. <laughs> there are certain homes that it's very hard to look at if the colors are jarring, you know, you have to cancel. Don't look at the walls. Don't look, you can change all that stuff, but boy, it's really, really hard to do. Mary Steele, you live in a warm climate. And I have an impression that people of brighter coloring groups, the springs and the winters, living in warm climates would have an easier time finding their colors in stores year round. Is that true? I think it's got to be. Um, do y'all have uh, much hot pink where you are? I mean, mm. we, I can almost always find something hot pink. Um, <laughs> no, not me not in September. <laughs> <laughs> I can bring home any amount so. of burgundy and teal. But <laughs> you know, and we really, we don't have a whole lot of burgundy and teal or, or forest green that I could think of. I, I'm really thinking we, we're very fortunate to have a wonderful clothing store in my small town and they have wonderful buyers. Um, but maybe they just sense how we are. We might have a, a medium blue or a, there's always some version of turquoise or teal, um, but no heavy duty, serious winter colors. And maybe that's because we don't have much of a winter. We try to get people, you know, a lot of folks want to get away from black. 
for all sort why don't they all, they wear it well but they have too much of it or they don't wear it well and that's that takes some time does it take some time where you are i know there's lots of black i can just imagine but for a bright season person who wants to get away from black that can they find all those jewel tones because hot pink is um i don't know it seems to me there'd be a lot of it all the time maybe but can they find a good selection of those jewel colors you know, it's funny. I have just had a, let's see, a bright, well, two bright winners, uh, one a niece and one a client, discuss that with me. You know, where do I find? And they did want to get away from business black. Um, and so I looked at a couple of stores online and I find that, especially uh, skirts and dresses are difficult to find. I'm guessing because uh manufacturers you know it's easier and less expensive for them to produce black clothing than you know to have an orchid color or a um you know pretty golden something or other uh, but anyway or or overcoats you know mm -hmm. if you don't want black or tan mm -hmm. you, you really do have to look and, and my clients who don't enjoy shopping especially uh that all right say the summers you know that kind of need to go more for gray than black it takes extra effort and extra time like everybody so, has to shop for their season year round all the time i have this impression when i think of southern women and men i picture the neutrals as light light pants light linen suits um, whereas here neutrals can be, can tend to be dark. It might be hard for a light summer or a light spring to find, or a true spring like you are to find, uh, their light camels and light grays and light neutrals. Is it that way there? It is. And I think, uh, French gray is also hard to find. Mm. I was looking for just kind of some standard, uh, lightweight wool, but wool, uh, camel colored skirts and pants this year. And I had a hard time finding just a traditional cut, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that didn't have, I don't know, you know, huge belt loops or I don't want crop <laughs> pants in the wintertime. You know, maybe it's difficult to sell something traditional because they assume everybody already has that. I don't know. Does the store inventory change significantly? Here we have four very distinct seasons. And so the store inventory changes a lot over the year. Does yours or you, maybe you have different traditions at different times of year? Like your fall is warm, you've said. Our spring is freezing. Yeah, they seem to be getting in new inventory probably at least six times a year. And oh. I think it is because our seasons kind of blend. Um, our fall is warm. We don't have, you know, rugged, chunky, lumber outdoorsy jack. clothes. I mean, I mean, you know, no, we don't My have favorite a, we look. Do. We don't, we don't have that that I know of at all. Maybe I live in a bubble. I mean, <laughs> people do, you know, if they're doing outdoorsy things, but just for running around town, no. People oh. go more for a dressy sweater and, you know, some kind of black pants. <laughs> What's your winter like? Um, well, today it's beautiful. Let's see, this is March. It's probably 70 something degrees. Oh. Now, two days ago, it was <laughs> in the 40s. Okay, I don't, I don't want to hear 20. anymore. About <laughs> okay. okay. New know, topic. I'm New topic. Outside thinking, oh, can I go paint later on this afternoon? Oh, my um, word. So, but your winter short, right? You had said that winter short stores. Yes, and I think that's why we don't have a lot of, you know, they don't commit to wooden woolen clothing mm. uh, during the winter because, you know, winter is December and maybe a few weeks in January and a few days here and there, February, and March. But I mean, March, spring is around the corner. We're ready to get out the flip flops. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, so. we are ready to kind of have only one wool sweater under <laughs> our big overcoat in March. But listen, I, I have the impression that you have like three seasons. It's uh, spring, summer and football season. You Tell got us it. more about that. 
that is it. I mean, I didn't even grow up as a football fan particularly, but um, football really is a religion in the South. I mean, that's said, been said before. It is a fact. <laughs> and we dress up for games. It's fun. People want to look spiffy, you know, like they were at a party. And we are glued to SEC football, that Southeastern Conference. And in case you were wondering, it is the leader in American football, right there. I was now. wondering. I said Thank it. you. It's been keeping me it. up at night. <laughs> so now we know. So okay. We do. Now you know. I mean, that is bottom line right there. Um, but anyway, people, and I, I, I think this is unusual, but people here do not plan weddings on Saturdays in the fall <laughs> because they know that either the guests have tickets and are going to the games, or if they come to the your wedding, they will be in a bad mood because they're missing the game. I mean, I've seen men back when we had to have, you know, radios with earphones. I've seen men sit in a church during a wedding with that earphone hooked up, listen to the Mississippi State Bulldogs for real. <laughs> and trying to keep a poker face. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so our fall clothing in local stores you know we have we have fall clothing uh but then we have kind of dressy casual clothing in uh red and blue which are Ole Miss colors or maroon and white which are Mississippi State uh and some gold to go with the black for southern Mississippi um uh, because they know that that's people will buy things. They want to buy things to go to the games and look well. Mm -hmm. They even have uh, kind of, you know, those flirty little cocktail dresses that are short and kind of slinky a little bit uh, <laughs> that the college girls wear to the games. Very flirty, very cute. Uh, the stores have nice looking raincoats because it may rain at the game but we are not going to leave our seats so we do have a short winter it's about december to mid-february uh come march like right now spring is around the corner jonquils are blooming um you know leaves budding out on the trees so we wear scarves to layer when the morning is cold but by lunchtime it'll be in the 70s so you can just take off your scarf it's hard to find the traditional wool clothing because there's just not a whole lot of need for it um animal prints are always big here they're kind of dressy ish but they are not totally committing to being um you know, going somewhere to a party or something. Um, the autumn colors that I see are kind of eye-catching. They're not really, you know, office appropriate in navy and gray and neutrals. Um, black is always prevalent because it's versatile and you can wear it with, you know, brighter patterns, jewel tones. And I, I suppose that's the way it is everywhere. On a recent shopping trip, um, I was I was really surprised to see some muted kind of soft brick, soft autumn colors in a shiny satin fabric, you know, ruffles and flourishes, short skirt, you know, the top and the skirt. Uh, they were very pretty and feminine, and uh, I thought it was pretty lucky find for the soft autumn girls. We love platform shoes and sandals here with a bright pedicure. Mm -hmm. Cajun shrimp in the OPI line is a very popular color. Are y'all familiar with Cajun shrimp? I'm familiar with Cajun and shrimp. Is, is that a color? <laughs> but, but is you that just about color? cannot go to the beach without Cajun shrimp on your toes. Oh, it's um, a nail polish. Oh, yes. God. I, I was, I was color, back. Christine. <laughs> Look, I was back. In, are those soft autumn girls going to know enough to buy those, that fabric? Or are they going to think it, you know, it's, it's not the hot pink that all their friends are wearing. 
but um, yeah, Cajun shrimp nail polish. No, mm -hmm. do you know what it is, Yard? Is it just me no, here I on thought, my? I thought it's honestly, yeah. it was. Do you have OPI? To bring to the yes, room. we have OPI. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Well, the the soft autumn girls are not gonna know that it will look best on them if they are soft autumn. Uh, they'll wear it because the cut is really cute. Um, it's different and it's in the stores, you know? Yeah, but. it really caught my eye. Yeah. So we see instead of, you know, heavy, dark autumn colors, we'll, we'll have, we always have kind of some version of teal or turquoise uh, and maybe a, cadet blue and some navy and uh, we've always got something with a little gold trim yeah, <laughs> keeping it spicy <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, gotta keep it spicy i think i'd make a really good movie the football game dress code it, it, so i'm still busy picturing this whole thing hoping I'm, that... I'm still busy picturing cajun shrimp name. right, right. <laughs> i think that's a vivid well, image so what I'm I trying know, really hard not to over enthuse about this. <laughs> well, I have this picture of these beautiful girls in their slinky, gorgeous cocktail dresses, and they're coming through the pasture <laughs> on their way to the bleachers. What do they got on their feet? They have got um, platform shoes, more than likely. Uh, because, you know, stilettos kind of go down into the grass. But if they live on the part of the of campus where there's uh, pavement going up, we, so we gather in this place called the Grove. Oh, so much fun. But anyway, if they're coming up the pavement, they can wear their stilettos. And so in the Grove, like, is it paved or do uh, people have tents or what? What's that experience? In the, in the, in, Spring in the in Quebec, there's maple sugar parties, mud, mud, couldn't be more mud, snow, mud, everything. And the syrup is coming down the trees and the horses, you know. So what's it like in the grove? Well, I know that would be fun, but uh, there's there's no maple syrup on anybody and there are no horses. Um, it's it's it is a grove. I mean, it's it's sort of a big circular area. I don't know exactly how big with all these beautiful old trees. Uh, and people, people will camp out the night before in order to, to kind of run in and tag their spot to put up a tent uh, because they're, they're, you know, they've got a group of friends who are really having a party under that tent. And then you multiply that by, I don't know, 200. Um, it's like, it's like Mardi Gras, but with a game in a couple of hours. I people have, have a hard time. In the tents. I have a hard time combining sleeping in a tent with slinky dress, platform shoes, and Cajun shrimp nail polish. I know. Am I the I only know. one who has trouble mixing those two in my head? I know. It just got to be that's fascinating. Just it, fascinating. it is. Well, you know, Mississippi uh, is rural, so I guess that's where the the grass and the trees come in. And also, I'm not sure if it's still this way, but Mississippi also had the highest number of Miss Americas than any state. I don't know why. I don't know why, but we like getting dressed, you know. There's uh, a I don't like hair tradition. extensions, but I see them out there. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean to tell you, the shortest dresses you have ever seen. Uh, <laughs> but they are so cute. They are like little butterflies out there. Yeah, um, it sounds really cute. I kind of feel, Mary Steele, like I would not be noticed in my dark winter colors. When I go visit you, I, it will, it'll be okay, but it'll be kind of a way to hide. Would I be noticed in, in Mississippi? Well, not at first glance, because flashy things kind of always come into your field of vision first. Uh, and you might want to get some Cajun shrimp nail polish before you come um <laughs> yeah. yeah well there you know there there's there's a place for for quiet beauty um but I think I think when there is a party or a crowd I, I don't know we just we kind of up your game out. yeah 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 it's interesting about women 
in your neck of the wood wanting to stand out because I'm I'm Norwegian and here in Norway, no, you know, women don't want to stand out. Nobody wants to stand out. To be conspicuous, that's, I don't know. We want to be visible, but we don't want to be seen as like we're trying to get attention or anything. And you know, I, I really am trying to understand that. <laughs> I just, I, I, I mean, I understand the words that you are saying, but it's like I almost want to say, come on, y'all. That is lovely. And, and, and it's so, it's so, I'm, I'm just mesmerized because it's so different. Because here, a phrase that I hear, you know, sometimes, maybe it's just in my family, I don't know. But, and it's used as a heartfelt and positive compliment. We say, oh, I met this woman and she was so nice. She was so ordinary. And that's meant as a compliment. And I'm, and it, we mean kind of that she's approachable, giving other space. And I, I have a feeling that that would not be a compliment in the South. Will you words that would never be spoken <laughs> <laughs> i think that being ordinary is is a beautiful kind of like looking at a cameo kind of thing and those are the kinds of people that i love to visit with and get to know but i would never really call someone ordinary that's just not that's just not in the vocabulary here. I don't know why. Um, I get it. I, I think looking ordinary, I use the word normal a lot because it means like everybody, you know, wherever you happen to live, which is why I like talking to color analysts in different places because everybody's got a different version of it. But it's it means having perspective on um, not being extreme. Not being over dramatic because appearance so often it becomes a game of everyone comparing themselves to everyone else, everybody outdoing everyone else. It's kind of like what was normal for young women in the 1980s was much more ordinary than now because now they know instantly what everyone else is doing. They look on the Instagram feed, this is what someone else is doing. So now you got to kind of either meet that or outpace it a little bit. And so now everybody's climbing this mountain of getting further and further from themselves. And so I believe in normal and um, ordinary. And I love it that a person of the same season living in the three places that we live would have a totally different closet from the same color palette. I think that's just mm -hmm. awesome. I totally think that geography and the quality of light has a lot to do with how color is worn. I lived in Santa Fe in the 1980s and I didn't really mean to be intrigued with color compatibi compatibility, but it, it just forced itself upon me. Um, so the New Mexico sky is this incredibly deep cobalt blue that you could just fall into um that part of the united states is high altitude so there's very little moisture in the air and so there's there's no moisture that would maybe mute the colors and the landscape colors are very bold there is a really red earth there is brushy green mesquite uh when, when there are clouds they are distinct there's never really a hazy sky so black clothing you know which is kind of a uh, bold color didn't look jarring as it can say where i live where the uh, there's a lot of moisture in there um in santa fe muted colors you know were kind of they kind of blended into the background and they looked soft but not really dull um when i came home to mississippi the new mexico colors that i wore like a kind of i used to wear this kind of olivey green and they were just boring it was like they just disappeared um we i live in an agricultural region the mississippi delta uh it is a an, an old floodplain like the nile river valley or something like that um, 
we have very high humidity. We have a soft, deep sky color, not that edgy intensity like in New Mexico. We have very lush vegetation. Uh, you, you just cannot beat back the vines and weeds and all that when it's the growing season. So black looks good here. You know, it, it's a little sophisticated to us, but real edgy color combinations uh, look out of place. Maybe it's because this is kind of a provincial area. Um, so urban styles make people in my town kind of turn and stare and wonder what that person is doing here because they just they don't blend in with the locals do you have snakes oh, I, I just yes. had to I had to know <laughs> yes <laughs> when we you do. were talking about lush vegetation I thought man that just sounds like grass you shouldn't step in oh it is I mean oh. yes you have to be careful yes snakes. oh gosh um I was thinking too when you were talking about how muted colors in New Mexico are colorful enough, how that also happens throughout the day. And I say this because, again, I'm putting together these color sets. So I'm looking at these sets of colors. And it's amazing how at the end of the day, when autumn colors and autumn light find one another, the, that end late afternoon light, you know, the low angle of the light and the red wavelengths, it just, they just set each other on fire. It is so fantastic looking. And I'm trying to think now, do spring colors look especially gorgeous in the morning or in the kind of place that has certain physical qualities in the air? Anyways, sort of thing I think about. But, you know, I found the same quality of light when I moved from Ontario to Prince Edward Island and all the summers that I spent here. The sky was bluer, like way bluer, partly the layer of smog pulled away. But I always thought it was more than that, like the amount of water, maybe the colder air that would hold less moisture. Um, I don't know, maybe more sunlight gets through and I was only there in the summer, but yeah, the, the colors are definitely brighter here. doesn't make season work differently though. In case anyone's wondering, <laughs> I wondered that that's why I mentioned it. I thought, Oh my gosh, this is going to all fall apart, but no, it did not. Thank goodness. What's the winter weather like Mary steel, like do trees, stay green here in November to April, your practicality gets jacked way up because you have no choice. High heels, like sports cars, you know, you're all over the road. Um, winter here is, I would say wet and brown, which doesn't sound very pretty unless you, you really look at it. Yeah. I'd um, pick it over frozen and white if I was given a choice though. <laughs> Not yeah. Well, um, you know, so trees lose their leaves, but maybe all the leaves don't come off. So that's brown. Uh, we've got some evergreen, cedar and that kind of thing. Not many spruce trees. Um, every now and then we will have a bright blue sky that is just wonderful. Um, I'm looking out right now at my window on some fallow fields. And um, I mentioned that we're in the, uh, the delta, which is a delta, you know, which is silt. And the, the dirt here is, if you really look at it, it's, it's a rich eggplant color. And I just love that. You know, some people might think it looks a little barren, but uh, I, uh, you know, again, I can't help it. <laughs> I'm always comparing like the color of the, uh, dirt part to the color of the wheat that was cut in the background you know to the yes. tree um it's amazing you got purple soil because ours is red rust I don't know if you noticed that when you were here um flying into PEI but the soil is bright red just like Anna Green Gables little braids you know <laughs> I noticed all the the water and I would imagine that gives you moisture in the air you know which softens the colors yeah, yeah. Awesome. and I noticed some trees in your backyard that I don't even know what they are we don't have them here <laughs> if I knew I would tell you <laughs> <laughs> so um since each of us lives in a distinct geographical area I'm kind of curious about the most prevalent seasons that each of us sees yeah that's a very very interesting topic and we talk about it sometimes Christine and I um 
For me, my rarest seasons are the autumns. Um, but I'm not sure if this is because they are, there's fewer of them, or maybe it's rather because they're not as eager as other people to book a color analysis to find out. Well, could be both, I'm sure. There's genetics spread all over the world. Um, and the seasons I see the most are winters. Almost half my clients are some sort of winter, have been so far. Um, and spring seasons is second, and then summer. And as I said, the, the fewest of them are the autumns. They're kind of rare birds for me. Well, I recall Catherine Kalitz saying that most Americans were autumn. But that hasn't been the case for me. Oddly enough, my clients lately have come in seasonal batches, and I have no explanation for this. Um, I've seen several bright springs and light springs. Earlier, I was constantly worrying about running out of the dark winter fan decks. Uh, and then before that, I had a, a huge number of dark autumns. Uh, the rarest birds for me have always been the two soft seasons. I think the distribution here is fairly even, but I agree they don't all show up evenly. I see the least true spring and light spring, I would say, as clients. But again, with all the Scottish ancestry here, I don't think the people are that rare. And autumn folks, they, they may that feel that talking about color and clothes and makeup, they, they can feel that it's a lot of fuss, but they are so glorious in their colors. And they've kind of picked up on this along the way. So I see a fair number of autumns and they gravitate very easily and natural to their colors. So there's no real hesitation about adding more of the same. It's just keep going on the road and pick up a few things as you go along. Maybe too, they don't add they don't attach a lot of emotion to color or appearance or clothing. They find they have that kind of get on with it and don't overthink it mindset that can be very useful. Yes, the practicality of the um, of autumn is a very practical season. Um, I do think that it's not that there are so few autumns where I live. It's just that I, I think fewer of them seek the advice of others. We don't know, various reasons, I'm sure. It's it's always kind of interested me about personality and color analysis. Uh, it's like surveys. Some types of people are more likely to do a survey and that skews the outcome, right? Uh, so do I see more bright seasons here in Mississippi? Or are they just the kind of people that are more likely to take the initiative to book an analysis? That's know. interesting. I've never thought about that. Certain personalities are more likely to take a survey and that would skew the outcome, of course. That's mm -hmm. really interesting. Also notice in working with students that folks from warm places find that bright color combinations look better. Not saying it's wrong. Taste is never wrong. But I do think color preferences can be habits. They're just like food preferences, they're absorbed from what's around us. You know, we train ourselves a little bit over the years and who wants to break or change a habit? So Mary Steele, would it be hard or challenging for someone to love being a soft season where you live? Oh, yes, it absolutely would. Um, the soft autumns don't have trouble adjusting here because those really are the, the colors that we have in our landscape. Um, my soft summers, though, have had trouble adjusting to the subtlety of the season. And I'm going to do a better job going forward with, with educating them on the front end, um, you know, so that they can recognize the beauty in the glimmer and smoke of that season. And so that they can see those clothing items in stores, you know, hiding amongst the mainstream bowl patterns and, and business black. Um, everyone has to give it time. Replacing the black especially takes energy and clients can get discouraged. I had this one young woman who was never happy with her soft summer season 
even with her mother and sister telling her how beautiful she looked. And she really did. Um, she was just certain that, that I'd made a mistake and she was a different season. So we did, did a redrape, still soft summer. And she just could not see herself in those calm colors. And I think she worried about it so much that finally her friends said, just let it go. Stop worrying about it. And so she did. Mm. She went back to wearing whatever she was wearing. And um, I hope older so. women that I've, that I've uh, analyzed have kind of panicked when I pulled out the bright season colors. I can think of one in particular. <laughs> she looked at the blush color and, you know, her eyes just got really big. It was fear. <laughs> it's fear. I know. I, I dab it on paper first. So they see it's only going to be a little diffusion we put on the face, not, you know, the, the, the product. That was interesting what you said about people being comfortable with the colors that they're familiar with in the landscape, because that could be a thing in Norway too, right? It, it, it's what they're used to seeing around them. So the colors look to them very, well, ordinary, it's just normal. And um, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And I really hope these color kits help people to help soft summer see it is not all mauve and gray for the first thing. And secondly, mauve and gray can do a whole lot when you give them a chance, when you put them with other things. So Mary Steele, do you see people of color? When I lived in Ontario, it was so common to see Asian, Indian, Arabic, um, Mediterranean, I and I loved it. And I learned so much about what the real and imagined differences are with color analysis and skin tone. Do you have that? I do. You know, and again, to me, skin tone, ethnic skin tone is, is another kind of palette and a way to understand color. Um, I've done African American women, not as many as I would like, uh, because there is such a gorgeous variety of skin tones there. Uh, and this can kind of be an awkward topic. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. once and I was in an Uber <laughs> and my driver had this gorgeous skin color. I think he was from Ethiopia. And I just kept picturing in my mind, you know, putting that blue drape or that purple drape, you know, up against his skin. And I knew I shouldn't have said anything, but finally I just said, you have got the most beautiful skin. Oh my goodness, that gold color, you know, whatever. And he was just about ready to slam on the brakes. <laughs> out of the car. Yeah. Like, Who's this yeah. lady? Right. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> oh gosh. So, and I've done a few Asian women and uh, I just feel like skin is skin and it's just that endless combination of yellow red and blue you know and it comes out uh and each person is different and i just love it it's mm. hypnotic yes hypnotic is a good word colors of skin can be so beautiful they are so beautiful but um listen mary Steele. I want to talk about makeup. I want to hear about the Southern approach to makeup because as our conversation progresses, I, I kind of sense that that too is really different from where I live. Um, here in Norway, women don't tend to wear a lot of makeup for, or actually, to be honest, it's very common to not wear any makeup at all or maybe a, a touch of makeup for occasions like mascara. Um, and well, it is probably true that they would wear more if they felt confident, confident in choosing colors that don't make them feel, you know, conspicuous like we don't. Um, just fresh and natural. Norwegians don't want to be conspicuous. But I have a feeling that women are not shy about makeup where you live. And your feeling would be correct. <laughs> um, we're we're into it. We really are. I mean, there's some women that um, you know, that want a, a natural kind of polish. I can think of that too. Um, but but most most women do, you know, want the the best blush or um, 
oh gosh was that you remember that nars blush orgasm was that big where y'all are yeah, yeah big enough yeah big on the yeah internet. well there's kind yeah. of a thing here you know it's pretty um but most women also dye their hair i mean i highlight my hair um as a color analyst i don't i don't even ask anymore whether somebody dyes their hair because I just feel like it's kind of personal. I just go ahead and cover their head with the neutral gray scarf. And I've done that with some men before too. Most don't color their hair, but every now and then you think maybe so. Um, most women here go blonde. Is that so where y'all are? Um, no, not so much here. Mm. My sister-in-law and I had a conversation years ago and I still remember it. We were talking about how beautiful silver hair is, but that the cut and maintenance has to be perfection. So that the silver looks intentional, you know, like a, almost like an accessory, not like you just thrown in the towel and just, you know, are not doing anything for your appearance. And I don't think, I think that most women really don't have the self-confidence to go silver. Uh, there's so there's so many that I know do something with their hair and, and really their the silver hair would be so much prettier. Mm. I a hundred percent agree with you. I, but also in the with the fact that a great haircut is important because that can give you that confidence. Perhaps even more important when your hair goes silver to have like totally obviously well-groomed hair and a killer haircut that it just stops people from thinking that you have let yourself go. Do your clients ask you two questions? One, do they ask you about hair color? Like, do they know color analysts can talk about hair color? And so if there's a more chatter, a flattering choice of color than blonde, and I'm wrong, lots of people here go blonde too, because that's what I look at in crowds. Like we really could talk about that, you know? Um, do you address it or I, like I figure if anybody could talk about it, it would be a color consultant who lives there, who's part of the same community. Well, usually uh, if someone's open to a hair color conversation, I know on the front end, you know, they say, I want to have my colors done and what should I do about my hair? Oh, they know. Um, okay. And then um, some you can tell they are just wed to that hair color, even if it's not not right. Um, I don't I don't broach the subject unless unless they ask me about it. I just I just don't do it. Um, yeah. But I might try to guide them. You know, say say I know that they, you know, like the blonde hair lot highlights, and I, I'm in that boat too. Um, I, I would say you know the next time you go to your colorist um ask for a platinum or an ashy highlight rather than the golden well that's yeah. easy enough to accomplish mayor Steele, as you get older um you're i know when you're you're mature right same age as yarn and me are you changing anything about your own colors because i'm learning and evolving possibly with the pandemic having had too much time on my hands i'm still learning a lot about my dark winter well I think more, I'm, I'm having more uh, changes with the way I'm used to dressing. Uh, I, I usually kind of wear a light and a dark and all of a sudden it dawned on me. <laughs> I don't have to do that. You know? <laughs> so, um, and I, I never wear brown. So I bought, you know, taking a walk on the wild side, I bought a pair of brown pants this year and I've been wearing them. Um, I have been known to throw them in the washing machine uh, and wash them on hot and hope they kind of tone down just a little bit. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, that kind of thing, but not really with the colors. I mean, I love my colors. And I'm always on the lookout for a, a cream color, lightweight sweater. Um, that seems to be the, the staple of my wardrobe. Are you changing your makeup or hair or, or you know, what hair, year, how you're using them? Hair has gone darker. Um, 
mainly because I just I just don't want to put forth the effort of uh, driving to somewhere to get my hair done and you know it taking an hour or two I, I don't mind doing that you know maybe three or four times a year okay four or five yeah. uh, but I don't really want to do it every eight weeks so and plus I really like the the darker hair it's more my kind of mouse color um it really looks better on me I I, I don't know it just uh the lighter you know warm highlights to me when when it gets to be too much it washes me out a little bit and uh, my eye color kind of goes away plus I just love not you know having the same light bleachy blonde thing going on as uh, so many people I, mm -hmm. I, I kind of I don't know I guess it's my version of going gray having a little bit more of a I hate to say mouse because that doesn't sound good, but it is kind of a dark taupey color. It's medium brown and it makes your highlights look better too. Is there, um, is there a makeup item you're never without? Well, totally concealer. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't go to the mailbox without concealer on. Um, I, I wear a little bit of makeup and, and perfume, even when I'm just working in my yard by myself, I just, I just like it. Um, so I, I love the aqua blue accent color that comes with my spring makeup. And I don't know about y'all, but I love blue eyeshadow. I realize that is, you know, kind of a taboo thing these days. I love it. So I put on just a little bit of the, uh, the aqua blue color. I'm really not, I'm not sure what the name of it is. And then, um, I have a, I think it's a Bobbi Brown cream colored eyeshadow stick. And if you go over the, the tealy color with that, it's kind of a shimmery light blue green. Pretty. It's fabulous. I love Sounds it. Sounds nice. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, speaking of uh, makeup items we're never without. I'm never without lipstick even in Norway, <laughs> I, I always wear lipstick. It just makes me happy. Um, I wear lipstick when I'm all alone, reading a book or vacuuming the house. And I'm, I'm, it's just, that's the one thing I'm never without. You lipstick. probably could even wear more when you're home alone vacuuming. You can really <laughs> put know, it on. <laughs> I know. Put on scintillate and just do the vacuuming. Yeah, and I know you wear your lipstick as blush too. So, I mean, that, I do, that could I be do. your vampy time is when you're vacuuming. <laughs> so I'm trying this new mascara. Um, I'm always kind of on the lookout for brown mascara because I'm so pale. It's hard to find. Um, but my sister-in-law, she and I are makeup enablers for each other. Um, <laughs> she put me onto this brand. It's called Heroin, Her Heroin. And then I, I don't know if it's make or mock or what. Um, it's a, an Asian uh, mascara. And the Asian world of makeup and skincare is enormous. Um, so I don't really understand the name, but I don't care that I don't understand it because it is so amazing. I mean, it is amazing. Uh, but you have to also buy the company's mascara remover because the mascara clings like a barnacle. I mean, it is not going anywhere. And I don't think acetone would get it off. But their makeup remover does, but it's gentle. You'd need like an industrial solvent. It, it, almost, it, it sounds like clumping cat litter. <laughs> Perhaps I shouldn't say that. That sounds lovely. It, yes. That is the best makeup remover ever. It's in a little a tube like mascara, which is so clever and sensible if you think about it, because when you use a mascara brush type thing with the remover, it gets around every lash. Mm -hmm. It takes off 99% of the con concrete mascara. <laughs> concrete so, um, mascara. <laughs> Amazon, I get it from Amazon and we'll, we'll have links in the show notes for that. Um, another good one is Lash Princess, which is also from Amazon. It, 
it is it does just what it says i mean when it says volume it means volume it mean it makes you look like you're in a dance recital <laughs> which on um, some days it's a good look <laughs> um and with this one you can use the bioderm micellar water remover or the heroin remover if you want to just get it off right that second i don't know this is so lovely i you you speak in such lovely pictures i can totally totally see that mascara. i like the dance recital thing i use um doll eye who makes doll eye N nyx maybe uh and it's hard to get it is very hard to find but if, when i'm filming the amount of makeup i have it's like it would be embarrassing to meet anybody but uh yeah so i'm gonna look up lash princess oh do do it's great <laughs> yeah what else do you do mary Steele? i know you have smart tricks for brows well i do because i have not um i use the dior show brown brow pencil and it's called it's called either blonde or sometimes it's called light brown it's the same same color when you use it. I don't know why they call it different things. Maybe I bought it online from two places. I don't know. Uh, and then there's a darker universal brown also that's supposed to be good. Um, but anyway, it does not go on with a hard line or, or, you know, real opaque. And the line is skinny, skinny, skinny. Um, it, it just looks like little eyebrow hairs hmm. uh, and it stays on pretty well so I'm so fair I look okay without using eyebrow pencil from about two feet away which means I look okay without eyebrow pencil when I'm looking at myself in the mirror uh, but for anybody standing farther than arm's length uh, my eyebrows well actually my whole face kind of just disappears <laughs> so when I get in the car and I'm going somewhere and I realize I've forgotten to put on eyebrow pencil I feel a little anxious <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I'm the I'm the opposite of um having no hairs I have lots of hairs in my eyebrows and it it runs in the family I have very bushy eyebrows and so me for me to to have my eyebrows, I need to tame them and kind of mow them, trim them, you know. And uh, I don't need to paint extra hairs because they're there. I I need to just color the outer edges of them. So I'm I'm kind of in love with tinted brow gel instead of pencil these days. Or so I've used brow powder in the past, but now I'm feeling like all I have to do is put color on the hairs that I already have um and it's, it's an age thing that the outer corners of the brows get kind of bland and uh, insignificant and and it really helps your the look of your face when you just um, enhance those eyebrows a little and i have i have one that i use from trini london and um it's a nice brown that's not too mustardy for me. And I, one I do want to try is Boy Brow Gel from Glossier. Have you tried that? I have, and I really liked it. I went through a brow gel phase. Um, it stayed on really well. And I don't know, just the quality of it, it, it seemed to kind of give distinction, you know, to the line of your eyebrow. Um, and the color was good. And that's the hardest thing to me for pale people is to have uh, something that doesn't go orange. Mm. I think my only problem with the boy brow was that I ran out. I mean, and I'm not saying that, that it didn't last long, uh, but a brow pencil, you know, will last for months and months. And I, I want to say the boy brow, you know, maybe was six weeks, maybe two months. I don't know. Okay. It was just kind of an ordering, but I could have ordered too. I just didn't think about that. Right. So Mary Steele, um, <laughs> should we return to our, what we started with talking a little bit more about uh, your specialty, which is the um, giving people advice on how to color their homes to be in harmony with their season? Sure. I, I think I mentioned earlier. You did. Oh, you did. Is there something else you'd like to add about that? Yes. How, how I, do you I just briefly mention kind of her approach? Um, you know, I mentioned 
the the undertones and um so what i do for my clients is i just give them a, a, a short list of you know say uh whites for for every season uh it, but especially light for autumn uh creams mostly for springs uh kind of a so mary still you, you give them specific paint numbers from like Benjamin Moore or usual it's mostly suppliers. mostly Benjamin Moore and and that is not to say I've got some Sherwin Williams colors uh those are that's just the line that I study I mean you know Pratt and Lambert paint is gorgeous you know there are a lot of good ones uh but that's just kind of the one I'm familiar with I think you are the only one I know who does that as part of the client experience your color analysis it's pretty unique what you have yeah and that's kind of hard for me to believe I just don't understand why everybody is not you know wanting to zero in on on uh colors that that make them look good you know it's like a setting for jewelry or something for me it's because I don't know how I've been in plenty uh -huh. of bathrooms and thought this is not working it might work for somebody but it's not working for me even if it's a light neutral but um, well, I, it would be so lovely if someone just gave me the list. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I really, I don't go out and pick these colors myself. Uh, these are just tried and true standard decorator colors, you know, cloud white, Dover white, Manchester tan, Edgecombe gray, those kind of things that are just used over and over and over and over uh, because they work and they don't, you know, go green on your wall or, you know look purple or whatever um and i just take those cool colors and some of them i've got, got painted on big boards some not um and just kind of divide them that's really all i've done these are not funky colors i mean you know i might have an accent color if i know it's good but uh i don't i don't really go crazy with these it's funny that you dress yourselves in the South or you yourself in bright colors, but you prefer quiet home colors. And maybe we're the opposite. We have a more neutral presentation, but homes and decor can be really intense and, or at least intense to me with my pale gray walls and exterior too. some maritime places. The street can look like a row of jelly beans. Yeah, I love that. I, I <laughs> especially love the uh, colors of the Caribbean houses. Yes. You know? Those just saturated orange and yellow and turquoise and green. I just love them. Yeah. Um, maybe because they're in the landscape, what you said before. And also maybe because the sun almost washes out some of the brightness. The The sun is so bright that the colors, if, if you transplanted them here, it would just be uh, neon. But there it's part of the landscape do clients ever show you like this is what's in my house what can I do do you get asked for color colors yeah and I'm happy to do that or shutter colors you know or or I don't, I don't know that I've done exteriors that's kind of a whole nother topic um but I don't I don't put myself forward as an interior decorator because I'm not um but I do I don't know, you know, people freshen up their houses fairly often. And I just think, you know, if you're doing that and, and you want some some good advice, I'm going to, you know, give you some options here. Yeah. Oh, I think some of it could be fun, especially with young people who, again, they would use color in the same season completely differently. Mary Steele, are you seeing clients at the moment? And, and where in Mississippi is Indianola? Uh let me think when was the last time I saw a client uh, I'm not seeing clients right now because my studio is kind of under construction um and I you know of course nobody did anything last year because uh you couldn't um Indianola is if you're not from this part of the world uh and you're looking at a big map we're about two hours south of Memphis, close to the river. Um, I'm about an hour and a half or so, hour and 15 minutes north of Jackson, Mississippi. I'm about 
three hours east of Little Rock, Arkansas, and I guess about five hours west of Birmingham, Alabama. A lot of big cities and New Orleans can't be that far away either. So, oh no, it's about four hours south. Yeah, very close. Well, good. So now, now people know where to find you, Mary Steele. And thank you so much for joining us today. We love hearing about color analysis in different places and discussing our different approaches and ideas and introducing our listeners to our analyst community. Well, thank you all so much. I have really enjoyed this. It's been fun being here and i uh, it's just been really wonderful to, to talk to two people who, you know, have so much experience and knowledge about color analysis. Yeah, so it's lo lovely for us, too, because we all work in kind of our isolated places. So it's so nice to know that there are kindred spirits out there. We will be sure to add Mary Steele's business information in the show notes. And Mary Steele's website goes live at the end of March, maybe sooner. And in the meantime, we're going to add some contact information for Mary Steele in the show notes if you want to reach out to her. Thanks again, Mary Steele, for being with us today. Bye-bye, everyone.